Um, this last chapter introduces a new version of our triangle. I don't want you to pay attention to that, all right? Because I want you to concentrate on understanding and using the triangle. They introduce a hexagonal model based on the triangle but developing it further. And it's really very interesting. Um, and if we had longer or we had a second attempt at motor behavior in the degree plan, I would go back and we would take a look at that. But I want to just keep it with what we've been working with all semester. I don't want to introduce a new model that changes up how we consider our constraints. All right? So you don't need to worry about that. Okay? Um, so this chapter is trying to pull together everything we've talked about up to this point. Okay? And they're reminding us that not everybody wants to be an elite athlete. You know? Um, and that for people who, who aren't in that context, their movement occurs within different contexts. It might not even be what we consider a movement or a play context. It might just be moving in their house or moving for their job. Right? If you watch the people at Walmart, um, they actually move a lot for their job. Right? So, um, even though they're not moving within an exercise or a sport context, our interacting constraints still play a role in those different environments. Right? So the other thing that we need to remember is that at certain times in the lifespan, particular constraints, individual constraints, are going to play a bigger role than they do at other times in the lifespan. So growing during puberty plays a big role in the movement patterns that we see happen during that short period of time. And then those movement patterns are going to settle down into something more consistent because we don't grow anymore. Right? Um, and remember that we've got change across the lifespan. So our goals as teachers are to enhance learning in whichever situation we find ourselves in, whether that's an athletic training room, and I'm trying to help someone relearn a movement pattern because they've had surgery, or if I'm a coach and I'm trying to help someone develop a more efficient or effective movement pattern, even though they've learned something previously, Right? It's hard to relearn a skill you know very well. All right? So it's important that we treat each person as an individual. We don't blanket everybody with the same kind of ideas. We have to be more flexible than that. We have to be able to look at a person and, and individually go, OK, what's going on here with that person? Right? And that informs the design of the tasks that we pick and we want to make developmentally appropriate for the people that we're working with. Right? It wouldn't work with our children on the playground if we set up a, a, a mini soccer session. Right? Because they're too young to understand the rules of soccer. They don't have the skill set yet to dribble a ball or kick a ball and run. Right? So that wouldn't work. And it seems obvious, but it's trying... At the beginning of the semester I said, you know, it's, it's understanding the why. Right? That's what will make you the better coach, better teacher. Right? It's easy to say, oh, well, it's obvious I just use a lighter ball. Right. It is possibly obvious, but why do you want to use a lighter ball? That's the key. Because then you know if it doesn't work, what else can I do? Right? Because the obvious change doesn't always work with everybody that you're teaching. Right? 
So we can manipulate different constraints, particularly the environment and the tasks, much harder to manipulate those individual constraints, those take time, right? And if we manipulate them well, then that can be useful in influencing movement and motor development and our children or our, even our athletes may achieve the intended skill pattern without realizing, without being conscious of that as the intent. Right? I can manipulate things so that I get what I want without people realizing that I've done that. Okay? So there's a really fun example in the chapter on page 367, and they're talking about a teacher who is trying to uh, encourage um, an overarm throwing pattern, but what she's getting is a lot of stage one where the elbow is pointing down to the floor and the ball's just being thrown not very far. And so what she did was set up a little game which she called cleaning house. Right? So she used small balls, she got a volleyball net and put it at a height that would be achievable. And what the children had to do was pick the balls up and throw them over the net into the other person's house, right? And so for them, it was just a game, clean up, right? Who could move the rubbish out of their house and dump it into the next door neighbor's house, right? So, but by doing that game, what she encouraged was this. Right? Just by constructing a silly game that was probably tons of fun for the kids. Right? And by doing that, we got one part of a more effective throwing pattern. Okay? Then I would have to come up with something for making sure that they were moving their feet because that particular game was aimed at changing the elbow. I might not have got a step with the throw, but it depends what I'm working on, right? Uh, which particular aspect have I chosen to manipulate, all right? So, one of the things I really like about this last chapter is that they introduce a further version of an assessment tool. But it's an assessment tool that also really can help you with creating lesson plans. And whether you're a coach or a PE teacher, lesson plans can be a pain in the neck because it's very really difficult to keep coming up with ideas about what can I do with this skill, right? And keep coming up with something that's original and interesting. So they call it an ecological task analysis. Okay. So remember that we are able to manipulate our constraints. So the first thing we can do is structure the environment. All right. So if I'm the teacher, I have to decide ahead of time, you can't walk in to your PE lesson or your training session and make it up on the fly, you've got to decide ahead of time what's going on that day, what are the goals for that day, what are the skills we're working on for that day. So we have to structure our environment. So depending on who you're working with, that might be, um, can I change the wall color? Remember we said that the wall color is important for catching, if we're practicing catching, right? Are we gonna play on the grass, or are we gonna play on, um, on cement today, right?
The weather's a difficult one because I can't manipulate the weather. Right? So whilst the weather is an environmental constraint, I'm not able to manipulate that. That means I have to be flexible. I have to have plan A and plan B and sometimes plan C. Right? But I'm able as the teacher, the coach, the trainer, the physical therapist, right? I'm somewhat in control of structuring the environment. Okay? Does that make sense? Right? The other thing I can control is the task. So ahead of time, I have to design the task. Okay. So we have three subcategories under task. We've got the goals. We've got the equipment. Anybody remember what the third one is? So, what's the goal? Right? Is the goal throwing hard or is the goal throwing gently? Right? Are we running really fast or are we galloping today? Right? Am I going to bring out great big soft balls? for catching because I want them to have success at catching or am I going to bring out smaller balls that would manipulate them using their hands rather than their arms? Right. What am I going to do? What's, what's my reason going into the lesson for what I want to achieve and how am I going to do that? Right? Do I need to consider body scaling any of the equipment or am I working with full grown athletes or full grown adults? Okay. So when I'm in charge, I have to do that and that ahead of time. Can't just go in and make it up. Well, you can, right? And some coaches do, some teachers do. Right? Because they've done it for so long, they know it so well that they make it up as they go along. But that doesn't build to success because you need a pattern, you need a path to get to the end goal. Or they're not learning. Or they're not. Right. They're not learning, they're not progressing, they're just maintaining what they're already doing. Okay? So that's not useful. Lazy. <laughs> Lazy, and the kids know it, and mm -hmm. they can sense it, and they can come over. Yeah, it doesn't motivate the children in the class because they know, right, that this is the same lesson they did last week or two weeks ago, right? So, when we think about task analysis, traditionally, we tend to have a picture of what is perfect in our head. And the task analysis becomes a comparison of what I'm seeing to my perfect picture in my head. Right? And that is often called an error model. Right? Because what I'm looking for is the difference between what I'm seeing and what I think it should look like, okay? The problem with error models is it doesn't allow for our individual constraints, right? If I have this picture that this skill is going to look like this, but this person isn't built like the person in my head, they're not going to look like that. doesn't mean they can't be successful at the skill, there are many ways 
biomechanically of achieving success in a skill that don't all look the same. Right? So it's, it's more conducive to be a little more flexible and we can use our constraints based approach to allow for the interaction between these constraints and develop an appropriate challenge for the individuals, right? So we're going to run through this idea today, she says. Yes, we are. We're going to go through a task analysis today, and then on Wednesday, you're going to do a task analysis, all right? Check your syllabus, it's 10% of your grade. So, do not come to class without your textbook. This will not help you be successful in earning your 10% of your grade. Okay? All right. So, the first thing we have to do when we are doing these task analysis is the pick the task or the skill, all right? So we're going to do kicking. All right, so that's step one. We've got kicking. Can you see this pen or is it? Uh, I can't see it. I've got it on here. Is it showing up? Mm -hmm. Can you not? No. Megastip, come join me. <laughs> Determining the individual constraints that I believe play a role in being successful at kicking. Okay? Now, we could have 15 of those, okay? But that's a lot to work on. So we just we're gonna pick three individual constraints that we think would help be successful at kicking. So, what do I have to be able to do to kick a ball? Balance, right? So, balance would be a good one. Okay. If I want to be able to balance, run fast, kick the ball a long way, what do I need in my legs? Strength. So that would be another good one. Right? Flexibility would be a good one. Coordination, right? Because I've got to be able to run and judge the distance and swing my leg and kick at the ball. Right? So flexibility, coordination, that's four now. So we'll stop there. There are more. Right? So you might, if I'm working with beginners, I pick the most obvious ones. If I'm working with someone who's quite skilled, I can pick something that is more subtle. Right? Step three. Step three is picking several environmental and task constraints that I'm going to manipulate. The key is I want to pick constraints that are going to help the individual develop these aspects that I've picked as important. Okay. So, task constraints in kicking. Right. So when we're on the playground and we've got kicking, what do I ask you to do? Move around, right? So, movement.
is a task constraint. Okay? Now, that could be, you could actually do that twice, because it could be movement of the person, or it could be movement of the ball. Right? The distance that I've got to kick the ball. Am I kicking the ball just a little way to my teammate, or am I trying to kick the ball all the way down the field to someone that isn't being covered by the opposite team and they've missed, they've missed that this person is free? Right? What about an environmental constraint that I could manipulate? The surface. The surface. Excellent. What about the type of chain? Like in the air, on the ground? Could, that would probably be task again rather than environmental. But yes, that would be if you were working with uh, a group who were more developed, that would be an excellent one, yes. Alright, so service would be environmental. Lighting would be environmental, right? Um, what else would be environmental? Um, am I doing it in a group or am I doing it in my own space? Right? So if we think about these, movement, whether it's me moving or the ball moving, is going to work on balance, strength, if it's me moving, right? coordination, if it's the ball moving, right? distance would work on strength, definitely work on flexibility because the more range of motion I've got, the further the ball is going to go, right? And surface would work on balance and strength, possibly coordination, all right? Does this make sense? Do you see how this is working? So we've got step one, step two, step three. Okay. Now we get to step four. Step four is creating a continuum from simple to difficult. You say creating a what? A continuum. So a range. I'm going to create a practical range. It's got to be practical because I want to be able to use it in the class. Right? A practical range from easy to hard for each of my task and environmental constraints. So we're going to start easy and we're going to work to half, right? And we could have as many steps here as we want. We could have just easy, middle, moderate, half, right? The more complicated the skill is, the more steps you probably would need, right? Again, it's up to you as the teacher how do you want to develop the skill. What do you have available to you might change how many layers you have in your continuum. Okay. So, movement. So whether it's movement of the person or movement of the ball, what is the simplest version? Neither. Neither. Stationary. Right? 
no movement. Person standing still, ball is still on the ground. Okay. Depending on how you like to work and how your brain works, I always find it easy to do. Or, or, I, I find it simplest to do the two extremes on my continuum and then try to fill in between, right? You don't have to, you can just do step by step, whatever works for you. So, stationary is the easiest. What would be really difficult? Bouncing, ooh, so if we're talking about the ball. If we're talking about the person running fast, right? And then we have to have something in between. So we could have the ball rolling slowly. We could have the person walking. It actually can be more complicated when you've got full movement because whether it's coming front to back directly at you or whether it's moving side to side or on an angle all adds challenge or spin. Right? That all adds challenge. So I could make it more complicated by saying I'm rolling the ball slowly directly to them or I'm rolling the ball on a diagonal and they have to go and meet it. Right? So I could create as many layers in this continuum as I wanted to. Okay? Distance. A short distance. Right? A very long distance. Maybe a um, curly path. I don't know what the technical term for that would be, sorry. <laughs> right? So again, you get to pick here, as long as it goes from what you consider easy or simple to what you consider hard or difficult, you've created different levels of challenge on your continuum. Okay. Now the surface, when we're talking about kicking, can be interesting. Because if we're thinking about, okay, if the ball moves a long way, that would be more motivating. Right? And the ball's going to move a long way, on the gym floor because it's shiny. Okay. But the gym floor is shiny and slippy. So that might actually be the most difficult to play a kicking game on. Particularly if you have individuals who don't have the right footwear. So we could say that grass is easy because it's easy to run on. I'm not going to be so scared of falling over because I'm not going to get that hurt. Right? But if we're talking about ball movement, grass might be, well probably sand is the most difficult. Right? But do you see what I mean? Right? So it depends. When, when you get to this kind of situation, you've got to decide what is it, what is my goal for the surface? Like, what do I want the surface to interact to create? And do you want us to explain that, or will you, like, when we, like, say I was to pick the gym floor, but you thought it was, you know, the hardest, like, do 
you want us to explain that, why we make the jump for World War II? Possibly. Possibly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying, though, because I think the jump floor. You think the jump floor, she can give an X then. <laughs> All right, but do you understand the, the process here? Okay, now, we've created the matrix, right, because you're going to end up with a page that has columns on it. And here's how we use it, right, because there's no point in doing all the work if you're not going to use it. Okay? So I can use it in two ways. The first way is to structure my lesson plan. So once I've created, if I create a matrix for every skill that I'm going to do a lesson plan on for the year, now I can go, okay, lesson plan number one with beginners. Da, 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 da. Right? Lesson plan number two. Da, 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 da. Lesson plan number three. Da, 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 da. Right? So once I've got the page, I can create any combination of challenge that I want to progress the children or the adults or whoever I'm working with to progress their skill level in a developmentally appropriate way. And if I have one person who, when I go to lesson plan number three, can't manage, then the next time I have to set up lesson plan number two and lesson plan number three. Right? Does that make sense? So that's the first way I can use it. The second way I can use it is to standardize my assessment with my individuals, with my children, right? So, pretend we don't have the orange circles that come forward to what we all out, right? We've got little Samuel. And so we need to assess little Samuel. I'm gonna pick my profile that I think might be appropriate for Samuel, right? So I'm going to say, okay, Samuel is eight years old and he's been having gym class, so I think he should be able to manage that profile. So I set it up like that and I have him tackle it. Okay? And what I see is actually he can't run up to the ball and kick the ball. So actually he's a little delayed in my opinion there. Right? He manages okay with a curly path or a longer distance because he's walking to the ball. Right? And he's okay on the concrete. So I know I have to work on this, which has a lot to do with his coordination. Okay. Might have to do with his balance, which would then include his strength. Does that make sense? Right. So then I have a picture of what he was able to do pre intervention, which is just the lesson plan, and we do kicking for 10 weeks of the school semester, and then I test him again, and I see what he can do at the end of the semester. So 
I will bring to you the scribble on Wednesday. I would like it typed up neatly to be handed in.